did. Man's sexual revolution began. Let me give a little precursor. Time Magazine in 1964 asked the question, what does sexual guilt mean to you? Ask it to a lot of people. What is sexual guilt? In 1964, the answers came back many ways, but most of them overwhelming said, it means when you break certain moral laws dealing with sex. That's sexual guilt, 1964. Time Magazine asked the same question recently and said, what does sexual guilt mean to you? And the answers came back over and over again saying, not enough sex. Sexual guilt in 64 meant this. Sexual guilt today in the eyes of the public means this. What happens, we become a totally godless, basically society in which God has been kicked to the curb. He's no longer convenient. He's no longer popular. He's no longer accepted. He's been kicked to the curb. Some years ago, David Frost was interviewing Madeline Murray O'Hare. Remember her, the infamous atheist, Madeline Murray O'Hare, and she was saying to David Frost, man, there is no God, and she was giving her case for being no God, and Frost was saying, oh, yes, there's a God, oh, yes, and finally Frost stopped her and said, I want to show you that most everybody believes in God, and he asked the audience there, how many of you believe in God, and almost every hand went up, how many of you believe there's a God, all the hands went up. Madeline Murray O'Hare continued to debate, but if she had said this, follow me, she didn't say this, if she'd been thinking, you know what she'd have said? Well, let me ask the audience another question. Do you believe that God came in fire on Sinai and gave 10 commandments as to how we are to live? Do you believe in a God who visited this earth in human flesh and died on a tree, died on a cross, so his blood would save all of us. Do you believe in a God who has called upon his sons and daughters to live a certain kind of lifestyle which is surrender to him? Do you believe if she had asked that to the audience in the God of the Bible? I don't believe many hands would have gone up, you see. I don't believe many. If God is out there, up there, somehow, God, I'll call on you if I need you. Oh, we believe, most of us, in some kind of supernatural power, but a God that asks for surrender and life and more. Oh, no, hey, I don't want that kind of God. That's not the kind of God I believe in. This is the foundation that gave us room to have a sexual revolution in the society in which we live. And what has happened? I'll tell you what has happened. Uh, do you believe that a dead thing will make you happy? In our sexualized culture, a lot of people Believe that a dead thing can make you happy. Anybody believe that? Sure we do. Let me show you how this is expressed in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number two, the first verse reads, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. And then in verse five, even when we were dead in our trespasses, we have the idea that all sorts of immoral activity, doing my own thing, making my own decisions, running my own life, deciding what's right and wrong, there are no absolutes, expressing myself sexually anytime, anywhere, anyway, with anybody, those are things that 
we practice in all kinds of disturbed ways, and they are dead things. Did you get that? Sin is a dead thing. It's not a living thing. And we have the idea that a dead thing, expressing our own life in our own terms, will make us happy, and it never has, and it never will. This is sort of part of the results, the bottom line of a totally sexualized society moved from any kind of moral foundation and roots. So we see man's sexual revolution, but I want us to put it juxtaposed with God's sexual revelation. What does the book say about the whole area of sexuality? We have the idea, they tell us, well, you're in the church, y'all don't like body, y'all don't like sex. Man, y'all are just reserved back there. You're a bunch of Puritans. How stupid, erroneous is that really? God gave us our sexuality. God provided for intimacy in marriage that is beautiful. Where did marriage come from? Genesis, God created man and woman in his own image, right? And the beautiful picture there of a rib out of Adam was formed into Eve and they didn't become two individual beings very long until they became one. And then we have marriage performed by God himself in the Garden of Eden. And what is it? What was marriage? He said, two became one. And what followed up was what happened in marriage. They were naked and unashamed. Leave. They left everything. Ever le marriage is when your mate, the one that you are united with for life, is the number one consideration of everything in your life. You leave every other relationship, father, mother, even children, brother, sister, friends, you leave everything else. Leave. Exclusivity. Man, woman, together, leave. Then you cleave, and the word there is like, like super glue. You, know, you, you cleave, you, you can't let go of you. you are one. We leave, we cleave, we become one flesh, a whole new personality, a whole new being. And then you're naked and you have no shame, total vulnerability. This is marriage. This is marriage. And we see it pictured so many times in the scripture. But the picture that I just love so wonderfully is found in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Listen. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says that two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. Then he says, flee, run immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside of the body, follow me, but the immoral man or woman sins against their own body. Here's the verse, 19, 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. We said that life is sacred, sex is holy. Wives, when you got married, you no longer own your body. Men, when you got married, you no longer own your body. Your body is owned by your mate. If a lot of marriages would really practice this talk right here in this same chapter, man, marriages would take on new dimensions right now. Right now. 
And then we see, well, what is permission? What do we have sexuality? What is sex? The Bible says in marriage, there's celebration, there's joy, that there's a beautiful, beautiful, intimate relationship. We described it. But the Bible also says any sex, listen, any sexual expression, immoral expression outside of marriage, a man and a woman, is pornea. Pornea. And pornea is under the judgment of God, and pornea in any kind of dimension will sap the joy and the strength and the life of anybody who lives a life of pornea. That is, fornication, sex outside of marriage. Adultery, sex other than with your marriage partner. That is, same-sex attraction and relationship that follows up that attraction, LBGTQ, et cetera. And you, anything with sex outside of marriage is pornea, and it's under the judgment of God. You say, boy, I don't like that. You got a problem with the Bible. You don't have a problem with me. You got a problem with the Bible. And so we see under all of this, we have been bought with a price. You know what the word pornea means? It means to be sold out. We give ourselves to pornea. We are sold out to pornea. We're sold out to the flesh. And, and then by the same token, the Bible teaches that Christ has bought us back. We were sold. He's bought us back, and he has restored us. And therefore, sex is holy. It is separate exclusively in marriage. Now, where does the church fit in? How do we live, perform, respond to all the challenges we have, particularly the area of sexuality? How does the church come in? How do we get in the middle of this? Well, First of all, people outside the church, <laughs> they're not interested whether or not what we teach is true. They really are not, most of them. Whether the Bible is true, Jesus came back from the dead, was raised by the Father, that's not what people outside the church are interested in. You know what they say? Why are you so bigoted? That's what they say. Why are you in the church so narrow, so bigoted? That's what they say. We have to understand, and many of us yet do not get this, who are in the church and know the Lord Jesus Christ, that that can never be a part of who we are because bigotry, it can never be a part of the body of Christ. Now, with our clear biblical stand on sexuality and many other things, they say, well, you're legalistic up there. We're not legalistic. Legalism was Judaism. They had 200-something laws written in the Old Testament, some 300-plus interpretation of those laws, and they were burdened down. And we're getting some of this now. There is this vocabulary, vocabulary problem. If somebody says something and Boy, you said this, you used the wrong word there. My goodness, you're so bigoted. Uh, I've told you this before. I had a funeral here some years ago when uh, our female professional basketball team had won the national championship, and the, the point guard on there, whom I knew, wonderful little lady, sweet little Christian, had cancer and died, and I had the funeral right here. People were everywhere. And in the funeral, I said, you know, she was a great little gal, great little gal. Well, I went back to my office, my phones were on fire. You called her a gal. I said, look, I called my wife a gal. Do you not know the song, as for me and my gal, where have you been? I'm not gonna let you take gal out of my vocabulary. I meant that with the highest esteem. You see, you've got this vocabulary monsters. 
You see it in the marketplace. You say the wrong thing the wrong time. My goodness, man, you'll be called to the office. So the bottom line is, we are not legalistic. Uh, legalism is keeping all those rules and laws. What did Jesus say in Matthew 11? I'll paraphrase it. I'll paraphrase. He said, come follow me. He said, take me in yourself. Hang out with me, in other words. And he said, you'll find freedom and joy and meaning and value and fun and significance. You won't be burdened down with all these little don't do this, don't say that, go, go there, that Judaism did. He said, I'm not a legalist. Christianity can never be defined by what you don't do and what you do. Well, I don't do this and I do that. There never is defined like that. It's that relationship with Christ. Therefore, we are not legalists. We do not fall under that area. Also, they say, well, you're hypocritical. You know, you, 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 you say one thing and you live another way, and I know there's someone who is a, quote, Christian, end quote, Christian, and their language and what they do and how they act and what they've done. You, you're just a bunch of hypocrites. Let me tell you something. In a degree... None of us live up to all that we profess and believe, but we're in the path of seeking to live up to it, are we not, if we're in Christ? It's like judging the impossible dream. You know the song? Now, if I would sing that, you might say, you know, I don't like that song. Yeah. Ah, that song. But bring our guy Jeff out. Huh. Let him sing. He'd say, boy, I love that song. What was the problem? With the song? Not with the singer. In, in hypocrisy, what is the problem? It's with you and me. It's not that which we're going to be and that which we ought to be, but thank God we're not what we used to be. It's not the printer. We, we, we are hypocrites in a sense, but they understand that we're on a path of sanctification. So that charge against us just will not stand. And then what's the other word? Judgmental. Well, up the church, they're so judgmental, they're going to judge me and judge me about that. <laughs> the Bible says, you shall not judge. I shall not judge. Now, understand, God has already judged some things, so we don't have to do a lot of judgment, do we? God said, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's already been settled, right? God has pronounced judgment on so many of these moral things. What God has judged, it is there. But we're not to judge. We're not qualified. Only God can do that. God has already judged some things. We read it in the book, that which he has judged. But we're not in the judgmental business. That's not who we are as members of the family of God, to point those fingers out there. And then finally, the thing those outside the church say most about us you up there, you are so intolerant. Oh, from those who are 18 to 35, that is the thing, the charge we hear. You are intolerant up there. Let me say something. We accept in the body of Christ anybody and everybody from every kind of background, every kind of sexual decision, every time of race, creed, culture. We accept anybody and everybody. We accept all. That's who the church is. There's no entity, any person alive that we do not accept in the church. Nobody. Let me give you a description here. And, and I love this right back there in Corinthians. And Paul is talking about, he says, those who do not inherit the kingdom of God. Now imagine a church made up of people like this. Would we accept all those people here? Listen at it. He said, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, sex outside of marriage, nor effeminate, goes up, talks about idolatrous, or homosexuals, sex with the same gender, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers who inherit the kingdom of God. Now look at this list. How'd you like to have a church full of, look at the list. 
fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, lesbians, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, party revelers, swindlers, they'll not inherit. How'd you have like have a church come? Would we welcome all those people there and say, we accept you, we accept you, and we will seek to love you, care for you, and listen to you, and counsel you, and befriend you any way we can. Would we accept a group like that? Let's get honest, folks. That was the makeup of the church at Corinth. Oh, oh, my goodness. Paul says, you'll not inherit the kingdom, but he says, but such were some of you in the church here now, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. We could make a list just like that if we looked at all of us here, couldn't we? You think we couldn't find all of that right here in church today? I guarantee you we could. I'd be on that list, you'd be on that list, different ways, different, different sins. Yeah, yeah, that could describe us. But thanks to God, that's who you used to be, and that's not who you are. Therefore, we are in the accepting business. But because we accept all people, it does not mean we applaud or we approve of all people. Acceptance, those in some areas of sin, thinks it means approval. And that's what about three-fourths of the churches in this city and in America have done. They have approved, trying to be culturally accepted, and we stand on biblical principles and say simply, we will seek to love and care and listen and help you any way we can, but acceptance is not synonymous with approval. You see, that's the Christian ethic in which we must be a part of. The biblical view, the church's view, as how we handle the sexual revolution which we're in. And the bottom line, we'd better stand up and speak the truth in love. Because we are in a battle for the very heart and soul and the moral fiber of our nation. And right now we're losing the battle in sex. man by the name of Brian Campbell, along with three other friends in Ohio. Brian was decided to go on a camping trip with three of his buddies, and they went to the Red Gulch River Canyon, beautiful place in Kentucky. They went there to camp out, four guys from Ohio. And as they camped out, if you read about it, Brian Campbell pitched a hammock between two trees, and got in it, went to sleep before his buddies. It was right on the precipice there, dropping down in the, in the canyon. And his buddies saw him get up out of the hammock, be, began to walk around. They realized that, you know, Brown is sleepwalking. <laughs> and so he's walking around, sleepwalking. And he gets to the edge, and nobody says anything to him, and whoosh, he falls over down to the gulch. Man, they run over there and look down, and they see that fortunately he landed in a tree that saved him. And they called 911, and the rescue people came and took them about an hour to get there. And they, they went down there, rappelled down another 30 minutes or so, and they took a basket down and they put him in it. He was still alive, miraculously. Put him in the basket. They were lifting him up about halfway up. He, he, he was knocked out. He, he awoke, awoke. He woke up and he looked around and Paul saw what had happened. And man, he was just astounded. And, and they brought him back up and they, they saved him. And they asked his friends. They said, look, you saw him. He was sleepwalking. He didn't know what he was doing. And you see, he was on the edge. He, 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 you see, he could fall off. Why didn't you warn him? And they said, we didn't want to scare him. We didn't want to scare him. Listen. 
Listen, folks. There's a lot of people sleepwalking. Family, friends, children, son, daughter, neighbor, cohorts, people we've known. They're just sleepwalking through all of this, saying we hope by some magical way all the moral challenge will be just dissipate. Listen, we have a call under God to sound a warning and speak the truth in love because they will sooner or later fall off into the cliff and be oblivious.